in this video, I want to check out this notion of sin. So sin, I'm going to treat uh, as, as a genus category and uh, with, a, with a variety of species. Uh, three of them, two I'll talk about, one I'm going to concentrate on, and one I'm not going to really talk about at all. Okay, the one I want to concentrate on, the species of sin, uh, is uh, it involves the human condition, all right? The second one, and that's called original sin. The other one that involves humans uh, is another species of sin, which is going to be connected to human actions and thought. Things like the seven deadly sins. Uh, so, you know, what pe what individuals are de doing, like actions, whether they're mental actions or, or externalized physical actions, uh, how those can be sinful. I'm not talking about that. Um, and the other, the other species of sin is sort of like the big one, the cosmological one, so to speak. It deals with the angelic condition, you could say, um, is primal sin. Um, and so I'm, I'll flesh out a little bit of the, the details and the differences in a bit. But think about sin as, as a concept, uh, not simply a morality, but it's a metaphysical concept uh, as well. Uh, at least within domain of, of theology, most philosophers really don't talk about sin when they talk about uh, morality and issues, but, but some do. It's a, it's a fairly subtle concept, and you can look around. Even Kant has notions of, of, of sin in his work, um, but they may not be expressly theologically uh, uh, constructed. Anyways, the importance of sin uh, for us in this video is that it is a kind of answer to uh, a, a great uh, philosophical uh, problem, and I'll get to that in a second. But sin is the genus category. It turns on uh, a key thing that, that you want to think of in connection with sin is the notion of choice and free choice, that is free will. Or as William James liked to say, there's a little bit of elbow room, right, in the universe for uh, choices to be made. So in other words, they're real choices. They're not just simply, uh, you know, you roll a ball down an inclined plane and then it, it, it hits something else while the ball didn't make a choice. It just rolled down the plane and struck something else. It didn't make a choice to, to hit anything. Or if you set up a pathway where it could go one or the other, um, it's not really a choice. It's just it, certain antecedent conditions line up, then you can be pretty sure that uh, the ball will go down the right side or pretty sure it'll go down the left side. You wouldn't say the ball made a free choice, even though sometimes we tend to talk like that. Like my car decided not to start today. Well, the car doesn't have free will, at least last time I checked, and I'm very doubtful that it does. Okay, so, so sin, I'm looking at it in a philosophical, theological perspective as a genus concept, needing free will, because you're trying to use it to get evil into the world. Why is that? Well, God's good. How does, he, how does evil get into the world if God's so good? Okay, so let's look at original sin now. Original sin this is largely in the Augustinian uh, style of things, uh, but there are different versions of it. Uh, uh, in any case, in roughly in the Augustinian way of viewing it, uh, it originates, uh, the idea of it, that is, and also metaphysically, uh, it, it's connected in, in the biblical tradition to the story of Genesis 3, the Garden of Eden, um, Adam and Eve, right? And, uh, you know, they made some decisions and, and they were told, don't do this if, you know, and they weren't really told what would happen necessarily in advance, but they were told, okay, you can do lots of things you want, but here's something you're not supposed to do. And so the introduction of a norm, if you should not do this, but you will have, uh-oh, you have that free will. You can if you want to, but you shouldn't. So, so a moral distinction is introduced uh, by God into the universe. And also it's coupled with, uh, and a real moral distinction means that there's a, a, a sense of choice, right? So if someone says you shouldn't do it, it means that you could do it if you wanted to, but you're not supposed to. So you should choose not to, but you could choose to do it. And of course they did. They went and had uh, the forbidden fruit and that caused a lot of problems, right? And what did it do? It gave rise to this notion of uh, original, this species of sin as uh, uh, something that was started more or less then um, through this free will and a choice that was made. And so uh, original sin is something that has is, is been passed along, right? It's part of the human condition to that you live in original sin. You're born into it and you die in it, more or less. And... Um, uh, what are some properties of this, uh, again, that characterizes? So I'm looking at properties of a property. So the property of original sin characterizes the human condition. Um, and what are its properties? Well, this original sin is inherited, right? 
Um, it is shared. We all have it. We all inherit it, right? It's, it's passed. It's passed along. And so it's universal, intergenerational. So no matter where you go, people have uh, original sin. And of course, in the history of the church, you know, uh, when 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 uh, uh, you know the, when there was the expansion, the colonial expansion, and all these kinds of things were going on, scholars would and theologians would debate like, well, are people that uh, outside of, of, of quote unquote Christendom at the time um, did they did they inherit this? So so there were some debates about about this aspect of it. Was it truly universal? So, anyways, that's not uh, uh, of our concern here. Interesting enough, but that's a historical uh, point for another time. So. The formulation is, uh, so it's, it's inherited, shared, passed along, universal, intergenerational, and ultimately, remember, it is the result, right? So original sin is uh, uh, the result of a free choice, and it has uh, effects. It, so original sin causes things to happen to us. So it's a property of us, and it causes something in us, right? Um, so you can think of it kind of like a sickness, right? So when you're sick... Right when you're physically sick, right? So this is sort of an analogy to original sin. If you if you are born, I guess, physically sick or something, well, it's going to damage some of your abilities. Some, um, but we got to be careful about what these abilities are in the first place. Anyways, so what does it do? Well, it weakens our reasoning powers, and I put a little asterisk. So I'm going to come back to that. And it is, in a way, the ultimate source of death, right? Because typically. Uh, you can read the Genesis as like, yeah, you're going to live in the garden. Here's here's all the stuff you need. Just don't do don't eat that fruit over there. Um, but basically, you could live out uh, all of your days because, uh, well, you basically all of your days will be all days because uh, you can live here forever, right? So the idea was that uh, that that the original sin that comes in through the free choice is the result uh, of a, of well, it's a result of, of free decision and its consequences. Uh, but one of them are, is death. All right. Um, now, I put a little asterisk here is the weakening of our reasoning powers. It's not the case that uh, we end up in total depravity from original sin. Like, oh, it's just you're, you're totally depraved and all that. No, your natural reason remains. OK, so humans have I, I, you can sort of think of it this way. We have a couple of, of gifts. Right. God, according to the tradition, gave a couple of gifts. Uh, well, he gave many gifts. Right. But constructed the whole thing but God give gave a, a reason and this notion of grace on top I'm not going to go into that that's a, a lot of theological niceties but this creating souls with grace right so they had natural reasoning plus grace um, and this grace was originally kind of like a special gift natural reasoning is also a gift but this grace was like like sugar on top right and um, this brought uh, the soul very close to God, right? It could know God in kind of a direct sort of way, I guess. But uh, however that works out, the, uh, the the grace really brings the soul very close to God. So with the result of this choice, you lose that gift. God takes that gift away, uh, but you still have your natural reasoning. It remains, so it's not total depravity. And through natural reasoning, you can still get to God, but it's going to be a lot harder, right? It's going to be a lot more difficult. So with the deprivation of grace, it is, you know, you're kind of distanced from God, right? So that's the idea. You lose this nice connection uh, to the creator, et cetera, et cetera, to the, to the universe as well. You become kind of an outcast. And uh, you can read that sort of like get out of the Garden of Eden as an example of being an outcast on, uh, on even, in, even, even in the real world, like the material world. You're kind of an outcast. So human beings are sort of like tossed out. Right. And while well, you're on your, your own now, you're kind of animalistic, you've got bodies and all that, but you're also semi kind of angelic because you have minds, but you don't have grace. So, uh, you know, it's a big loss. Right. So. Um, so what happens with the deprivation of grace? As I said, you're you're kind of ter you through this free will. It's not like it was imposed, but through this turning away, you lose your grace um, and you're open. It leaves the soul open to certain kinds of, of suffering. And concupiscence, uh, which is a great uh, a term that theologians like, um, which is like strong desire and tendency to sin, right? It opens you up to that. If you had grace, well, you probably wouldn't be struggling with sin. Um, okay, so opens the soul to suffering, like isolation, distrust. It could be all kinds of things, distrust of other people, right? You live in this isolated 
um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, negative kind of way of being, right? All right. And, uh, and, and, and so you still have your free will, of course, right? Um, you can still uh, use it to try and get back uh, uh, close to God. Um, you can come to knowledge of God. Um, and, and, but now, as I said, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, well, if, if, what about, uh, uh, you know, standard questions of people are born into sin. Does that mean you're born condemned to hell? Well, if you go look at my uh, Dante video, there is a little space kind of in hell that's not really all that bad. It's limbo. Um, now, as far as I know, that's not really technically part of, uh, of, of uh, Roman Catholic doctrine. But Aquinas does talk about it. And it was sort of a place where, you know, the, the children who the only sin they have is original sin. They're not really going to be punished for the bad ones, like going way down into hell, because those are the sins like over here. So original sin um, isn't, isn't, doesn't mean you're totally depraved and all that and you're going like to hell. You're not going to go down into lower hell just on the basis of original sin. But it seems you can't get into heaven, though, because you are tainted with, with sin. So there is, but since there is heaven, you can in some way use your natural reasoning in some way through your free will, get to God and bypass hell. Uh, you might have to go through pur purgatory, though, probably pretty well. Everyone does in the in the in the theological sense of that. Um, but it's not the case that uh, original sin necessarily condemns everyone in a total state of deprived to a total state of depravity and then to hell. Now. There's a variety of things we, we can say of, uh, of this. Um, the first thing you could say is, oh, come on, is this fair? Like, this is like, like even if you accept the story of, of Eden and all that stuff. Okay, let's say you accept all that. But you could say, is this really fair? This doesn't sound fair at all. Like, come on, look with the, if, 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 if these people, if this is all real, if this is all a real story, okay, so let's say you, you admit that. Um, this seems ridiculous, kind of like, this doesn't seem fair at all. Like, why, why, why am I responsible? Right. So let's distinguish between something that's done that that taints succeeding generations and something that's done where it obliges or produce or or you know uh, creates a sense of response intergenerational responsibility. So intergenerational could be like intergenerational uh, staining and inter intergenerational blaming. Those are very different. Um, Leibniz addresses this question of, of original sin, and he says something like this. Well, look, the history is what it is, okay? That's what happened, okay? History, or history is what it was, I guess I should say. Um, and so you had Adam and Eve, they did what they did, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, you had this, they had this. If God would have said, says Leibniz, okay, I'm going to stop the clock, I'm going to stop the cosmological clock here, and I guess admit a kind of error, I don't know, and, and say, look, um, Adam and Eve, it didn't work, I'm going, to, I'm going to get rid of, they're gone, I'm going to start it all over again with Adam, with, with upgrades, I'm going to upgrade Adam and Eve, I'm going to upgrade them so they don't make that choice, well, then, uh, you know, then Leibniz says, well, okay, but that would be a different Adam and Eve. Would, would they necessarily have free will anymore if God said, yeah, you can choose all this stuff, but I'm going to make sure you don't choose that, or I'm going to change the situation of your choices. Would you have free choice anymore? So let's say God did that and ran the story out again with, uh, you know, upgraded Adam, upgrade Adam 2.0 and Eve 2.0, uh, Garden of Eden 2.0. What would that be? Well, Leibniz says, first off, if you go back and you change the past, you know, those of you who've read any science fiction stories, you know, you go back and you and you goof around with the past. Well, you goof around with the past. It may have caused all kinds of things. Your parents wouldn't have met, blah, blah, blah. You're not here anymore. Poof, you're gone. So Leibniz say, says, you know, in a way, your existence relies on the past being what it was. And and that's what it and that's what it was. So. Uh, would you want it any other way? I mean, you might say, yeah, sure, it might be okay if I didn't exist. Um, but on the other hand, you might say, well, even if that is the case, I mean, that certainly doesn't really answer the, the fairness question. That sort of dodges it. It just says, well, um, would you want it a different way or whatever? Of course, it doesn't prove that any of this happened either. 
But even if you accept that this all happened, it still really doesn't address the fairness question. My point here is just to bring out that some theologians and philosophers have tried to struggle and provide some answers. But uh, as brilliant as Leibniz is and how much I, I respect and admire his work, I don't think he hits the nail on the head on this one. Um, in any case, uh, so but, but people have tried to make the argument that, well, OK, maybe it's not, as I said earlier, Maybe it's not intergenerational blame, but it's an intergenerational stain in the sense that, yeah, um, what, what's happened is that we're not really uh, bad or anything. It won't cause us to go to hell or limbo or anything, but it, it does isolate us, right? Original sin is a kind of isolation. It is a kind of corruption. It is a kind of... Uh, 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 not depravity, not a state of total depravity, but it has degraded our reasoning, right? And we suffer as a result of that. And so uh, it's kind of like, I imagine you might make a story of like, uh, let's say uh, you grew up in some with your parents and they had some strong kind of cult-like beliefs or whatever, and you were raised with those. Uh, that might make it very hard for you to... Uh, to uh, accept, you know, science and all kinds of things that would commonly be accepted, right? It might be hard for you to do philosophy and mathematics and all this because you would have been grown up with this deep suspicion of all this stuff um, because uh, your your parents' sort of cult beliefs might have, been, you know, been transferred onto you and make your life harder. You feel isolated from society, et cetera, et cetera. So you could think of it as an intergenerational stain or disadvantage uh, rather than uh, a blame. So it's, we'd say, yeah, you're not really to blame for how you think, um, but uh, uh, it certainly affected you negatively. It's caused you to be isolated or whatever. And um, it might make it very, very difficult uh, for you to exercise your free will. If you've been uh, if you've been tainted by something like that, so so that's one way th that some theologians have tried to think of it. But in any case, it's a it, it's it's a big and interesting and complicated topic, and I'm just sort of dancing around on the surface. Now that's the notion of original sin, and I want to distinguish it from which connects to the human condition, right? It's not human actions, so but the general human condition. The second one was this primal. Uh, 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 sin, which is another species of sin, a great genus, right? Again, free will. Well, the angels were also created beings by God with uh, with free will. So they had their little angelic wing wing room, maybe elbow wing room, you want to call it. Um, and they too, not all of them, um, uh, so they don't seem to have this general corruption because there was only a couple of the angels. Uh, well, actually, it was more than that. It was a number of angels, but a subset of the angels that rebelled against God. And of course, they were led by Lucifer, you know, this very special angel, the big, the lighted one, the bringer of light and all that stuff. And uh, Lucifer is the one that rebels and says, hey, I don't like the way the universe is going, God. This is long before humans appear in the biblical story. But Lucifer is not happy. And he leads a rebellion. And then they get booted out. Uh, there's sort of the first kick out of paradise is, is a subset of the angels. The, the rebel angels you can think of. Um, so they that's primal sin. So that's how the sin originally comes into the universe. And how does it come in? Well, it is kind of connected with, with pride, right? You know, Lucifer is very proud uh, of himself. Pride in, in, in the sense that, you know, he quite likes who he is and um, thinks that, you know, maybe he shouldn't have to be subordinate or whatever. There's different accounts of this story, but the important thing is, is that through free will, in both of these cases, that elbow room gets uh, sin into the world, right? So sin is a product, right? It's not introduced into the world. It's a product of free will, which is introduced in the world. And I think you can think of it all that uh, is sin, is, is, like the upshot. What's sort of the takeaway of this is that Okay, God is, uh, he's got all his properties, you know, like he's, he's omniscient, he knows everything, he's omnipotent, uh, he can do anything, and, and of course he's, he's ultimately good, he's, he's completely good, right, without uh, any evil or sin, or right, in, in and of himself. So how does sin and all this stuff and this evil get into the world? So God is good, so why is there evil, right? Standard question, right, uh, alongside of good God make a... a 
a, a fancy can't jump, stuff like that. So is there some kind of strange contradiction in this property of being, uh, you know, infinitely benevolent and infinitely good? Um, because if he is, then what he makes should be good. He shouldn't have evil intentions or make bad things. Well, how do you get evil into a world that's made by God without diminishing, right? Because God supposedly creates everything. How do you get evil? How does evil appear into the world? How do you get it metaphysically into the world? We see it's there, unless you want to deny it's there. That'd be, you could take that and you'd have a lot more work to do, but largely you have a bad world. It's created by God. So how do you square the cosmic books? Well, you can think of it this way, that God is, is good and all, has all those great properties, um, but he, he creates beings that have free will, angels and humans. A subset of the angels uh, make bad choices, right? So they have choices over here. This is the, the realm of God more or less kind of ends here. No, you're not supposed to put limits on God, but in a sense, we can think of it as God creates free will and the possibility of true free choice, um, then, of course, the, does God see the choices in advance? That's another topic for another day. But basically, God is not responsible for those choices. God sets it up where it's like kind of like you when you wish your kids good luck in life. Like, hey, I hope you're going to do well, but you have to make your own decisions now. And I hope they're good ones, but I, I can't make you make decisions. So God sets it up. And some of the angels went to good, some went to bad, and that's how you get primal, this sort of this, this primal evil into the world. And then with humans, it's like, well, there's only two of them at the time, and they both go in, so that taints all of the the uh, 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 the humans afterwards. So and that's how you get original sin. But the basic idea is that sin and choice and all that and freedom was trying to solve uh, a, a very interesting and difficult problem. God is good. Why is there evil in the world? And this is one way to answer it while trying to preserve a lot of divine properties of God, as opposed to throwing out those properties, which you could do and you get a different kind of God, or pitching the whole theological structure altogether and just saying, nah, there's none of all this. It's just, it's just that. I mean, so anyways, these are the choices some thinkers have made. See you next video.